Hello, and welcome to another edition of the Dr. Joseph Warren Historical Society interviews with prominent authors and historians specializing in the colonial period. Now, my name is Randy Flood, and I'm joined today by my colleague, Dr. Uh, Doctor, use it again, Christian, Christian Despina, right. author of Founding Martyr, The Life and Death of Dr. Joseph Warren, The American Revolution's Lost Hero. Uh, this presentation is brought to you by the Real American Revolution public education television series and the American Revolution Consortium for Civic Education. So Christian, why don't I introduce our guest today? Right. Nathaniel Shidley is the first president and CEO of Revolutionary Spaces, a new cultural organization created by the merger of the Boston Society and the Old South Association, dedicated to creating a new place for two precious historic resources, the Old State House and the Old South Meeting House at the very center of Boston's cultural and civic life. Previously, Nat taught early history, American history and native history at Wellesley College and served as the Boston Society's Director of Public History. In the latter role, he curated and provided creative direction for numerous exhibitions and programs, including Blood in the Snow, an immersive site-specific work of theater that dramatizes the pivotal aftermath of the Boston Massacre in the very room where the events took place. Nat's work is guided by a deeply held belief that public history at its best can do more than tell us about the past. It can also deepen our understanding of the present and equip us to build a more just and equitable future. Very commendable. So Nat, welcome to the Dr. Joseph Warren Historical Society. And Christian, why don't you ask Nat the first question? Yeah, Nat, we appreciate you being on and carving out some time. Thanks for having just yeah, let's just start with with the two buildings. You know, can you can can you give us some background concerning the old state house, the old South Meeting House, and and the importance of the merger that formed Revolutionary Spaces? Sure, I'd be happy to. Um, yeah, and the merger is the product of a long arc of conversation between two really important and old uh, preservation organizations that date back to the 19th century in Boston, um, Bostonian Society. Um, took over the care of the Old State House in 1881. Old South Association was formed um, a few years before that to preserve the Old South Meeting House, which um, both buildings were threatened during the second half of the, of the 19th century. Um, and Bostonians rallied to preserve those organizations because they recognized the importance of the stories that live within them. Um, so the Old State House um, was called the Town House when it was first built. It was built in 1713 to serve as the seat of government for the province of Massachusetts Bay. Um, and, you know, it was at the center of the political events that culminated with the independence of the United States um, in the 1770s and 1780s. Um, Old South Meeting House um, was built in 1729 to serve as a uh, as a meeting house for a Puritan congregation in Boston, one of the many congregations in Boston. But it was also the largest um, indoor gathering place in revolutionary Boston. And as a result, it became a place where large popular political meetings took place. Um, so both organizations um, tell many stories, were, were telling many stories within those sites, um, but uh, the, the most important stories they were telling were the ones that revolved around the story of the nation's founding. Um, and as we looked at the possibility of bringing the two organizations together, they're, they're really, the buildings are located just two blocks from each other on one of Boston's busiest streets. Um, it really became apparent to us that it could be transformational. Um, and that's because each of us was telling an important story um, without really being able to tell the real story because the story of the, the, the events that happened within the official politics that unfolded in the townhouse were of course um, in dialogue constantly with the popular politics that was unfolding especially at um, Old South Meeting House and in other locations out of doors as it was called at the time. Um, by bringing the two buildings together and uniting their stories within a single unified visitor experience, we're really for the first time able to capture the tension between high and low, between official and unofficial politics that was the engine that drove 
the founding era and remains the engine that drives our political conversation, our conversation about who we are today. Um, so I think by bringing them together in one organization, we've really created a cultural resource unlike any that exists anywhere else in the country. I mean, these are independently among the most important historic sites anywhere in the United States and among the most important in the world um, because of the history that they witnessed and were at the center of. But by putting them together, um, we've created something that doesn't exist anywhere, right? That these, you know, a, a touchstone for the story of popular politics, a touchstone for the story of the official politics, um, but capturing the tension that was so central to the era. Um, and, and also capturing the, the two streets, thing, the two blocks of the street, because um, there were folks who couldn't go into either building, um, but who still played a role in the events of the revolution. So we're, we're really excited to be right at the beginning of shaping um, a new way of telling the story. Um, and I hope that these buildings will become known, not just to our local audiences, but nationwide during these next years. Yeah, and I'm glad you brought that up about the close proximity, because I think unless you're actually walking around the streets of Boston when, you know, maybe you've heard of these buildings in passing and you know the association, you just don't realize unless you're actually there how, how close they were, this, this center of uh, resistance activity. And, and, and really, you know, we know that both buildings played an important part in the pre-revolutionary phase of the resistance and the rebellion, and we know that Dr. Joseph Warren played a part in a lot of those events. You know, Old South's been a, a hub of freedom of expression for almost 300 years. And a lot of your work centers around bridging the gap between the past and the present. So can, can you talk to us about the power of public memory and why it's so important in connecting these two worlds? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and there's many ways of coming at that question. And, and um, you know, I think the, the first thing to recognize is that um, these buildings bear witness to the genesis of a series of conversations that are unfinished in American life, right? So to the extent that, um, you know, the, the, the townhouse, the old state house was where the elected representatives of the people of Massachusetts met, um, the, the building was awash in a, a series of arguments over who ought to have a voice, right? Who's, who should vote? Um, whose voice should be reflected in the halls of government? How should people um, bring their voices forward? And of course, the popular politics that were happening down the street were about people claiming that voice and asking themselves, right. well, what's my recourse if my voice isn't heard? Um, and, and at the broadest level, um, what we're talking about is the creation of a series of questions that each generation has to answer for itself, right? And what they really add up to is our unfinished conversation about we the people, right? When we say we, when the constitution begins with that word, it doesn't begin with a definition. And it's been up to each generation of Americans to try to grapple with, well, exactly who gets to count. Um, and that's the argument we're having in every neighborhood in, uh, in America today, um, it's the, the through line for every generation. So if you were, if you were to think of um, American politics and American life as a, as a river flowing from uh, the 1700s down to the present, the deepest, truest current in it is our argument over these questions. So we really feel like um, the work of public history in this setting is to give people an opportunity through the transporting of power of place to feel themselves to be connected to that current, right? So um, to see where it comes from, but also to recognize their own place in it, right? Um, I think it's, it's if, if we do our work correctly, one of the outcomes is that those who take part in our programs recognize that they too are founders because they too, like the founding generation, are testing these questions and finding answers anew for our own time. So that's, that's really what I think the highest calling of public history can be. 
Um, and Christian, if you'll allow me to just add one more thought to that, sure. yeah, of course. Um, I, because um, you know, it's it's wonderful to be uh, to be speaking with the Joseph Warren Historical Society about this because I often think about Warren when I think about the power of memory, um, and Warren understood that memory is not about the past. Memory is an intervention in a conversation about who we understand our, our who we understand ourselves to be today, right? So Warren um, uh, more than once had an opportunity to deliver an oration remembering the victims of the Boston Massacre. Um, and when he stood in the pulpit in 1775, on March 5th, 1775, and stood in the pulpit at Old South Meeting House to speak to a, an, an immensely crowded hall about the events that were now five years in the past. He invoked that history and he invoked the memory of that tragedy, not to give people a better understanding of what happened, although he clearly could speak to that, but because he wanted them to think about their role in building a better future, right? So um, memory is the tool through which we shape tragedy, joy, all of the past experience that we have into a sense of common purpose, right? Mm -hmm. That's what Joseph Warren was doing in 1775. He was saying to his audience, come together in defense of our understanding of what liberty means. Um, and I think that's the role that memory can play today too, right? We, we have a very divided country right now, um, but I think we're bound together by the fact that we're all part of this argument, no matter what side of it we fall on. Um, right. We share a commitment to debating these fundamental American questions and that, that in itself holds us together. Um, so, you know, I think we have a really important responsibility during these coming years, right? 2026 is gonna be the 250th anniversary of independence. Um, we're gonna be talking about our founding history, so how do we wanna use it? We should not just be using it to tell a story about who we were. We should be using it as a platform for shaping the story we want to tell ourselves and the world about who we are now and who we're trying to become. Right. Well, Matt, you just uh, Matt, you just mentioned the Boston massacre, and I knew that uh, we know that you were involved with the governor and the mayor and celebrating the activities associated with the Boston massacre and celebrating the 250th anniversary of that. But uh, tell us about the current exhibit about Christmas addicts and why it's important, and how, after so many years, it remains really relevant to us today. Yeah, sure. Um, so yeah, we we had a wonderful event on March 5th, and then we closed on uh, on March 12th. So the exhibit opened on March 5th, and I think like 400 people saw it during the week before we closed. So for all intents and purposes, when we reopened to the public on August 1st, um, the exhibit opened then. So it's open now uh, uh, at the Old State House, and people can come and see it. Um, the exhibit uses Christmas Addicts as a lens for this larger exploration of what the power of memory is. And, and Addicts, is a, Addicts is one of the five uh, folks who fell on the night of the Boston Massacre um, is a great, um, he's a perfectly appropriate uh, and valuable um, lens through which to come at that subject, partly because um, he, he's been used over many, many generations by activists and those advocating for racial justice as a tool in their own um, efforts to redefine what we the people means. So um, we, the exhibit really has three main components. One asks us to, um, to recognize how much more complex the early American world was that addicts belonged to, right? Um, he's sort of entered into popular memory as, um, as an African-American hero, um, but in fact, he was of mixed African and Native American ancestry and exploring the world in which he lived allows us to see how complex it was and the Afro-Indian world to which he belonged is one um, that that not enough people know about. Um, and so the first part of the exhibit explores that world and tries to help us locate him not just in the history of slavery, 
which in itself is surprising to many of our visitors, that 10% of Boston's population was enslaved at the time of the revolution blows people's minds, but also allows people to explore what it meant to be a native person in, um, in New England at the time of the founding, which I think is a, a, an important and, and too often overlooked um, piece of the story. The second component um, asks how, um, how different generations of activists mobilize the memory of addicts in order to build support for their cause. So black abolitionists in the 1850s um, begin elevating addicts as a kind of focal point for public memory um, because they're engaged in a conversation with slaveholders and their allies um, who are saying, well, you couldn't end slavery because what would you do with former slaves? Their argument was that um, people of African descent didn't have the capacity to sacrifice on behalf of the common good, which at that time was understood to be the basic requirement of citizenship. And so you could have former slaves, they said, but you couldn't have them as citizens, so what would you do? Um, so William Cooper Nell and, and other um, black abolitionists in Boston pointed to addicts and said, well, you, you may not have met our friend Crispus Addicts, who was the first to make that sacrifice. So sorry, that, that argument doesn't hold. Um, but it doesn't end there. Uh, you have civil rights activists, William Monroe Trotter, Melnia Cass, uh, in the 20th century, um, pointing to addicts um, and and making a different kind of argument about how he um, uh, how he relates to the nation's unfinished conversation about racial justice. So the middle part of the exhibit tries to explore that story, um, and then there's a third part that really just asks how um, how artists and writers, poets have imagined addicts and asks us to think about. You know, what are the sort of archetypal roles that he's assigned in our collective memory, in our visual memory, in our written memory? Um, as a hero, as an activist, um, sometimes he's set with the founding fathers, the sort of more standard um, pantheon of founding fathers, and other times he's set apart. And so it allows people to explore that through, um, through art and poetry. Right. And, but but it, I'm sorry, what it really adds oh. up to is, is a conversation about race, citizenship, and memory. Um, and as we embarked upon a series of anniversaries that will culminate in 2026, we just thought it was important for people to start by asking themselves, well, what is the work we're actually doing when we remember the founding? Are we just remembering history or are we remembering who we are today? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that really plays into the next question because we really want to know, look, we've been following the work you've been doing. We admire it. We want you to keep going. But what's on the horizon for revolutionary spaces, right? Because we know between now and 2026, there's several commemorative anniversaries. You know, I keep thinking about the two Boston massacre orations and uh, the, the Boston Tea Party. So th these are going to be important events. And I think a lot of people don't realize that by the time we hit 2026, those events are just going to be a blip on this celebratory radar. So can you talk to us about some of the programming you're developing, whether it's going to be virtual, in person, and what you have in the works that's going to happen over the next few years? Yeah, sure. Happy to. Um, and, uh, you know, there's many, there's many elements to that. Um, but I think at the, at the base of it is um, an arc of learning that our own organization needs to go through. So um, we are still in the process of becoming an organization um, that uh, that represents the diversity of the country that we live in and the city that we are a part of um, at, at, and that can speak to the questions and concerns that our diverse audiences have in a way that feels authentically meaningful. Um, so I think a core part of our practice is learning how to operate in partnership with um, folks in our community and to share the resources that we have as a platform for the conversations that feel meaningful and important to them. I think our, our core um, work is understanding um, that our job is not to stand on a podium uh, and tell people what the past is all about, but is rather to invite people to join our circle and become with us 
participants in the work of making meaning. And I think it's, it's in making meaning of the past that we recognize our common humanity. Um, so I think that's especially important. Uh, in terms of the particular uh, initiatives that are underway, so one is just getting to a place where we um, have a, a, an engaging and immersive visitor experience that uh, seamlessly spans the two sites and the two blocks between them. So, you know, an ambition that we have by 2026 is to really have a cultural campus encompassing these two blocks that tells the story of, across the urban landscape and that has, you know, components, exhibit elements and movies and tours that exist in both buildings that relate to each other. So there's that level. Um, another piece of it is um, is really building out an arc of signature programming that is an invitation to people that excites their imagination and gives them a sense of belonging in the work that we're doing. Um, and, and so, you know, this year, in addition to the exhibit, the signature programming was going to involve two plays um, and a dynamic public art installation that was really going to have a whole series of um, community engagement participatory elements in it. Now, because of the pandemic, we had to defer on some of that. One of the plays is still moving forward. So we commissioned a play about Crispus Attucks um, that is, uh, you know, the, the, the script is now close to complete and we'll be um, hopefully staging that early next year. And in the meantime, doing some table readings that allow people to follow along virtually. Um, we've commissioned another play that will um, at some point be uh, staged at Old South Meeting House that really will, um, I think, maximize the site-specific opportunities for theater in that space. But what we're looking at is, you know, how can we prog programmatically use contemporary um, forms of storytelling, unexpected ways of coming at the past, whether it's a rich, immersive digital experience or a play or, or art or something that, that gets people out of the customary space that they associate with public history work so they can see the past with new eyes and so they feel themselves invited to connect that past to the questions that they're grappling with today. Um, you're right, we have a couple of important anniversaries coming up. So, you know, the, the work around the 250th of the massacre was all about exploring the power of memory as a tool for changing the future. Um, when we look at the 250th anniversary of the Boston Tea Party, which of course has an important bearing on um, Old South Meeting House, so that'll be in 2023, um, and we think in the in the years surrounding that anniversary, the work really should touch the theme of protest um, and really get people thinking deeply about what the role of protest is in a free society. I mean, that is newly alive in our in our um, right. public conversation right now. What are the boundaries that we should not cross? And um, when do we need to consider crossing them? Under what circumstances? I mean, we have all kinds of uh, of touch points from this history that could really be helpful in exploring that today. And then as we approach 2026 and we celebrate as a nation 250 years of being an imperfect independent nation, I think that really, that's really the moment to think broadly about that, that the meaning of we and to, to think about our programming as an invitation um, to have that conversation around we the people. So, you know, Christian and, and Randy, I'm, I'm hoping that when we're uh, sitting here talking together in 2026, um, we will have realized the vision that we have to make our two sites and the work that we do the nation's most powerful classroom for liberty and democratic debate. And I think that's, you know, that's the power of public history to do that work and it's really up to us to make it come to life. Absolutely. Yeah, and that's why we wanted to have you because we, we really think what you're doing is so important. I, I love that idea about the cultural campus and con connecting these two sites. And really, just to kind of carry on with that, you know, we know that the, the COVID-19 has been devastating in so many ways, least of which 
It's affected museums. It's affected historical societies. You mentioned that you had to close right after that you, you had that event with the governor and with the mayor celebrating the 250th anniversary of the massacre. So really, we, we wanted to try and highlight you, the work you're doing, th these public sites, how important they are. And, and just one thing that comes to mind, you know, you just said an imperfect union, and I can't help but think of those words to form a more perfect union that we're still striving to do better and that it's been a long journey it's going to be a long journey but but really what what can people do to help revolutionary spaces through these tough times you know what can we do is there anything you wanted to add whether it be how to donate or what you're doing there to keep everyone safe when they come to visit and you know and I'll and I'll give you the floor right here to make this uh, appeal Thank you. Um, yeah, I mean, it, it, there's no question if when we were drawing up our plans for launching a new organization, um, we did not include have a massive pandemic that forces us to be closed for five months. That was not on the list of key strategies. Um, we're looking at, you know, we're looking at loss of $2.5 million in revenue this year as a, as a result of the pandemic. So that's, it's a tough blow, but we'll make it through um, you know, we're really still um, looking to folks to help us build audience. So the thing that I would um, really encourage people to do is to consider becoming a member of the organization um, so that you have a clear line to what's going on and are part of the, um, the, the conversation moving forward. Um, so, you know, will we'll members get access to events that are just for members, but they also get first dibs on access to the events that are for the whole public. Um, and you'll, you'll be kept up to date on what's going on. Um, and we have a lot moving forward. You know, we've got, we've got uh, four panels around the, the sort of addicts themes coming up just in September alone. So there's, there's a lot going on. People can sign up to become members. Um, on our website, which is revolutionaryspaces.org um, slash membership, I think is the website that you can find your way there from revolutionaryspaces.org. So um, we hope that, um, that people will consider joining in that way. Um, but, you know, it, it beyond that, um, being ambassadors for the work that we do, if you like it, if you think it's exciting, share it with a friend. Um, try to help us get the word out. That would be um, that would be hugely beneficial at this point in time. Yeah. And of course, we'd love to have everybody make a pilgrimage at some point during these anniversary <laughs> years to come and see the old state house and old South Meeting House in person. Maybe just wait until next year. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and one of the things I just wanted to quickly say, I I was there about um, maybe about eight nine months ago. And it really is amazing when you know you're on this busy, bustling street in Boston, and then you walk into Old South, and there's almost this sort of tranquility. And I also want to stress that you know this building doesn't just represent you know the pre-revolutionary era, but it carries through the centuries. And I think I thought there was a you did a great job of highlighting some of that with some of the. The, the, the cutouts of the people, and it really was interactive. But it, again, it's almost such a, when, when you walk in, you just feel this, this I don't want to call it a vibe, but it's just, it's just a stark contrast from the street outside, and you realize you're immersed in the history and walking in the, literally in the footsteps of history. And I know Randy and I both feel strongly about bringing history to life, and I, and I think you've been doing a great job with that. So, so really, thank you for that. Thank you. Thank you, Christian. Yeah, there's, there's no replacement for standing there, and there's something transporting oh, right. and magical about yes. that. You know, Absolutely. I, I think the... The first time I I went to see Gettysburg, I just remember standing on the ground where Pickett's Charge happened, and all the little hairs at the back of my neck stood up on end. And and I think that's the same experience that people should have when they step into our sites. And it's really then the question is, what do we do with that energy and excitement? How do we direct that to make a lasting memory and an experience that people will carry with them and that will give them a different way of thinking about what it means to be part of this ongoing experiment in free government. Absolutely, absolutely. And given the statistics nationwide that show that uh, more and more people know less and less about our American history, let alone the American Revolution, I think it's timely what you're doing, what we're trying to do to try to educate America about 
the future uh, and looking to the future by understanding the past. You know, absolutely. So crucial. Absolutely. Well, listen, uh, Nat and Christian, that's about all the time we have for today's interview. Uh, our guest has been Nat Shidley of Revolutionary Spaces, and we'll be able to put a link up on our website to showcase that, uh, that site, okay? And uh, thank you, Nat, for joining us. On behalf of Christian and myself, we really appreciate you joining us today. And folks, uh, uh, join us again next time for the Dr. Joseph Warren Society interviews, and so long for now. Thank you. Thanks, Nat.